Stay standing. Don't sit down yet, all right? Stay standing for a minute. There's going to be a handoff here. It's like a relay race. He just passed the baton. It's a microphone. But anybody here identify as a prophet? Because I know we're gathering here. If that's your primary gift, you identify. Anybody here think you can prophesy? Every other hand is supposed to go up right now. All right. So, Lord, we say we have the word in season right now that is needed in Atlanta, that's needed in Georgia, in America, in the Ukraine, in Russia, in China, and that we want to be courageous people that are willing to lean in and even look foolish for you because we don't mind how we look because we know we represent the kingdom of God and it's not something we can always figure out with our logic. So, Lord, we release what's been activated in us today and we will lean into it in a greater measure in Jesus' name. Amen. I was wondering if I was going to make it under this speaker here. It's working pretty good. Um, so my wife is the one that was up here talking about Rab Shaka. That's Tricia Roselli. I'm Peter Roselli. We have a church in, uh, in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, 23 years uh, since we planted the church. I was working at the time. I work in finance, and a lot of times when you plant a church, you have to work because, you know, whoever sent you out isn't supporting you. <laughs> So you wonder, did we really get sent out to play at a church, or did they give us the right foot of fellowship? And this was a nice way to say it. But uh, it was good, you know, no problems, because plenty of people, you know, the Apostle Paul was making tents even when he could have stopped and, and received a salary. I know it's not for everybody, for sure. We have people on our payroll staff that are full-time, so I'm not against it. But the one good thing I think about it is, it keeps you very relevant to what the people in the pews are having to deal with when they have mean bosses and difficult jobs and tough situations. Because if we're not careful in the church and we're only ever around Christians all the time, it can get a little fluffy and, 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 and lack a little relevance. And, you know, I'm, we're in New York City area. We're on the New Jersey side in the New York City area. And that's why I talk fast. I don't even always realize I'm talking fast. <laughs> but uh, you have to there. You can't get a word in edgewise if you don't jump in. It's like the way they drive, you know, just be aggressive. So you, you would go, I would preach on a Sunday and then go to work on Monday and then have to apply on Monday everything I told the church to do on Sunday afternoon. That's a very humbling thing because it's not just theory. You know, you have to put it into practice. And it's mammon. It's, it's a mammon spirit over New York, right? Like there's a movie made about Wall Street, and one of the main lines people remember is greed is good. And one interview I went on one time said, we're looking for people to work here that love money. <laughs> I mean, you just, that's right out of the devil's mouth, right? You got, Jesus said you can't love God and money. You're going to love one and hate the other. So how do, you, how do you respond to that? You have to operate in the opposite spirit of what you're in, and you have to prove to them that your way is better by your actions. Sometimes it's a sermon, but often it's the way they watch how you behave, and then they see favor on your life. And on Wall Street, it's, it's a lot like being a baseball player. Uh, you know, if your batting average isn't going well, you can't call up the Internet and say, don't publish my batting average, <laughs> right? Like, uh, everything's out there. So if you're a money manager, your rates of return are published every day, and you can't hide, right? So it's just one of those things, like reality check on a regular basis. And Christianity should be that way, but we're so nice to each other sometimes that we don't ever want to criticize anybody. But we're supposed to speak the truth and do it in love. So, I don't know, can you put that first one up that I sent you guys? Um, I just, I had a name that the Lord gave, it, gave me for this session that I got this morning, which is interesting because uh, he was focusing a lot, Andrew loved that, that was great, on cycles, and it's just how the Lord does things sometimes. We hang around with Chuck Pierce a lot. I don't know if you know the relationship between Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets. Dutch was much more the teacher, the expositor, and Chuck just gets up and lets you know what the Lord has shown him right in that moment, which is awesome. But he tried to get Dutch to do that, and Dutch was ha getting a little triggered, right, because he didn't have his notes to go by. And one of the prophets said, uh, the Lord's going to show you how to preach from the river, right? That's what we all need to do. That's how we need to live, is that we're, yes, of course, decently and in order, but let all things be done. How can we always just focus on the decent land in order part, right? So what I'm saying here is, is, is contagious faith has its own momentum. And you'll see in the Bible often that they'll say, we're going to pray for somebody right now, so if you don't believe, it's better if you leave the room. Because we only want people in here who believe that this can happen. Because unbelief has its own power of negative energy. It says that Jesus could do no miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. That's shocking to me. God can do anything. 
But this, this uh, stronghold of unbelief has its own set of power. So it's not wrong to tell people, listen, uh, I'm only taking John and Peter up to the mountain with me right now. The other apostles might have felt rejected by that. And even Peter kind of put his foot in his mouth. What is, what, how unusual, right? Oh, Lord, we should build an altar for you here. It's like, no, like you don't stay in the glory. You go down and bring the glory into the community, and you're going to go cast out demons down there, right? So the point is we have a stronger power than this thing called collective captivity. I'm going to touch on that for a minute because he put this cycle idea out there. So I brought this book with me, and I've been talking about it to our church about it. Can you go to the next one for a second? It's a lot. There's going to be a lot on this slide, but this is a chapter in this book by Peter Wagner. He put together a compilation of a bunch of different people that spoke at a conference in 1988. And one of the chapters says, in dark dungeons of collective captivity. <laughs> wow, right? But contagious faith will still free you from that captivity, that cycle of captivity that people are in. Now, you look at the right side first. It's, this was done in 1988, before the Internet. I don't know. If you're too young to remember days before the Internet, can you raise your hand for a minute? Anybody know what a Dewey Decimal System is? Like, if you don't know what that is, then you're missing something. But you guys have a big advantage over what we have when we were in high school. Mar Mar <laughs> Mario Marilla said, I was born in the year 19, none of your business. <laughs> But it's like, you know, we didn't have all this internet checking everything, checking the facts. We had to go look up out of a book, right? So you had a big advantage. So this man in 1988, he was out in, uh, in he was a missionary in, in the jungles of South America, and he was recognizing how the spirits were operating with collective captivity in the tribes. And because he was a Christian, he identified this cycle. And it's a little unusual because it starts at the bottom there, and it starts with distraction. All right, we're going to work our way as if it was 6 o'clock on that clock, okay? We're going to go with clockwise. So what I said for today, we would call it clickbait, clickbait, right? So distraction, how bad of a problem is that here in Atlanta? Because where I live, it's a huge problem. You can't walk in a restaurant and not see the people all staring at their phones at the same table. They're not even talking to each other. We're so distracted. We don't, we don't have any attention span left anymore. But you're supposed to study to show yourself approved. How can you study if you're distracted, right? So that's an easy way for him to deceive us. But this was also happening in the jungle. So it's, it's a human nature problem that we're easily distracted, right? So we would call it click, click, clickbait. And the two ways the enemy will use this is something stimulates you, either through pornography, that's a huge problem on the Internet, or through rage. There's some kind of rage button that they're trying to push in you, especially around politics. But we have to be discerning enough to know that this is, this is a lure of the devil, and I'm not going to take the bait. I'm going to stay focused. My wife, to her credit, I, we've been married 37 years. I, I married her when she was still in grammar school. <laughs> not allowed to lie in church. Your nose will start growing. But uh, like all the years we've been married, that was the first thing every day. She's in the Word. She's praying. She's getting getting herself centered on that compass that she knows she's going to follow. And because I was working so much, you know, doing both, I, I felt like I didn't always have the time. But, boy, did I learn the hard way. Don't say I'm too busy to pray. You're too busy not to pray, okay? That sounds like a cliche, but it's so true. Because, one, I'd rather be one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere, right? Like, Because if I hear from you, it won't take me as long to know what I'm supposed to do. And not only what I'm supposed to do, but how about what I'm not supposed to do, like getting distracted with the clickbait, right? So then we start to lie to ourselves. We say, oh, this isn't a problem. This is harmless. See, as I'm going up the levels from one to two. And by the way, I'm an adult, you know. I get to make my own decisions. And uh, I, I could quit if I wanted to. These are the kind of lies that we start telling ourselves. So you go from what it says distraction there to deception, but then it becomes a dependency. And that becomes a habit. See habituation on that line between ha dependency, and now it becomes domination. And now it's habituated in you. So when you wake up in the morning, the first move is the phone. And you start scrolling. And you don't even think about it because it's become habituated. And that's how sin is. It gets a stronghold in us. But what happens is that domination backfires on the enemy and on us. I don't know about anybody else here, but I was a drug addict before I got saved. So I know exactly what this is like, okay? When the devil says jump, you say how high. 
you're actually scrounging around in your ashtray in your car looking for the roaches. If you have three or four roaches in there, that was the, the little bit that was left. By the time you were burning your fingers on the joint, like you threw it in there because you were getting burned, but you're now so desperate to get another joint that you get all the roaches and you try to make a new one. Oh, my God. Get out of the pigsty, man. Get out of the pigsty. Come to your senses. This is not the child of God that he meant me to be, right? It's horrible. So you become abusive in addiction. You abuse your relationships. You lie to people that you love. And you don't realize it because it's a blind spot, and that's what the devil does. It's a cycle. And, and when it starts to wear off, you start coming down that other side around 1 o'clock. And, and because of the destructive behavior, a lot of times people will do an intervention with you. And they'll say, you know what? This isn't working. Like, you know, if you're going to be married to my daughter, you're going to have to stop what you're doing or you're going to have to separate. And then the light bulb goes on and you're like, oh, boy, I better change. So the thrill is gone. I don't know if you remember B.B. King, right? But the thrill is gone. And I've been found out. So what? I'm going to now go either on the straight and narrow or this guy's argument on the left-hand side is you transfer to a deeper dungeon. You transfer a deeper, darker dungeon. If you were doing two and alls or some kind of barbiturate, now you want to go to some stronger drug. If you were watching pornography at one level, you want to go to a deeper, darker dungeon because that's not satisfying you anymore. This is a lie of the enemy. It's collective captivity. If you think about politics, what's happened in America is that we're all screaming at each other. And that's not Jesus. So there's this narrow road that leads to life for all of us. Again, if I'm on... Uh, a trading floor in New York City, they're not singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They're dropping F-bombs like an F-16, boy, I'll tell you. And the women, too, like back in the day when I was younger, they didn't curse like they do now. But why am I there? I'm not defiled. I'm not saying, oh, no, stop saying that. That's, that's not occupying until I come. They tell a dirty joke and you don't laugh. And they're like, what's wrong with you? And it's like, well, it doesn't seem funny to me. What if that was my daughter? And they're like, oh, shut up, man. Don't make it. Don't put no guilt trip on me. My body, my choice. <laughs> Unless it's the vaccine, then they got an exception for that one, right? <laughs> That'll be another day's uh, lesson, right? I love this one. I just can't read the whole thing from here. Proverbs 27, 20. Read it out loud so you can help me out. And destruction, never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. Yeah, but men are basically good in their nature. You're all Christians long enough to know the heart is deceitfully wicked, right? It could be 99% good, but boy, that 1%, that's your evil twin. When that evil twin comes out, you don't have anywhere near what you're going to do, right? So unless you break out of that cycle, you go into a deeper, darker dungeon. And, and I'm not here to end with, with bad news here. I want to end on good news because the prophets are key to this whole thing, in my opinion, okay? I know the fivefold ministry is all important. I'm not trying to pick one over another, but it does say the foundation of the church is built on the apostles and the, yes, yeah, so you all know your word, right? And why are those two important is because, again, in the extreme, the, the prophet could float off too far off the earth and just see visions, and the apostle could get so legalistic that everything has to fit in the little box on the spreadsheet, right? A prophet looks at a spreadsheet and says, those are bars in a prison. I don't want no spreadsheet, man. I, I got to be free to see what I see. It's like, all right, well, come back to earth and let's talk about how we're going to get this done, right? <laughs> so, well, we got to balance this out. And I think what you said about the, the what was it? It was a D13 and a D12, uh, but two sixes. Two sixes might be prophet and apostle. We need each other. It's two wings on the bird, right? The bird can't fly with one wing. So we need that balance. And even though you're not always feeling like your allies all the time, but, you know, the, the apostle has to give the prophet room to see, and then the apostle has to pray into how do we, get, how do we execute this strategy that you want. But, but the, if the prophet is shut down, and in our church, many people have come that had an intercessory gift that wasn't recognized in their prior churches that they were. And they were called things like Jezebel or you're too, too opinionated. And they got really wounded by the church. When the, all it was was the church just didn't recognize the gift that they had. And, and if, you're, if you're confident in that you know who you are, you're not jealous of another person playing a different position on your team. Because you know if we want to win, we have the, have the best quarterback playing quarterback. 
and the best wide receiver playing wide receiver. And what we do in the church is we put quarterbacks at wide receiver and then tell them they failed. They didn't fail. You just put them in the wrong position. You didn't value their gift. But everybody that walks in should feel like, you know what, I'm going to be hurt if you don't find your full potential because we all need each other. I'm going to finish in a portion of Scripture. I don't know. I got eight. Wow. I got seconds. Yeah, that's I'm done. <laughs> I'll tell you quickly. 2 Kings 3.15, it's Elisha, and he's in a bad mood because he's seeing Jezebel's son, and he's supposed to give a word, and Jehoshaphat's there, and he said, you know, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat being here right now, I wouldn't even look at you right now. If you're a prophet, you know that's not a good place to give a word. So what does he say? Bring me a minstrel. Because I don't want to speak out of my carnal flesh. I need to hear the Lord clear all this static out and make sure I don't speak out of my carnal soul, but that I speak the true word of the Lord. I bless you all to do that. I'm sorry I went over. <laughs>